The broadcast of the regular meeting of the Minneapolis City Council will now begin. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lisa Bender. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council. I'm going to call to order this regular meeting for Friday, January 29th. Before we proceed, I'll note that we have remote participation by council members and city staff as authorized under the provisions of Minnesota Open Meeting Law Section 13D.021 due to the declared state of local public health emergency. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Council Member Gordon. Here. Council Member Cano. <clears throat> council Member Wright. Present. Council Member Fletcher. Council Member Schrader. Here. Council Member Osman. Here. Council Member Cunningham. Present. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Goodman. Present. Council Member Johnson. Present. Council Member Palmasano. Present. Council Member Cano. Council Member Fletcher. Council Member Ellison. Vice President Jenkins. Here. President Bender. Here. There are 10 members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. The agenda for today's meeting is before us. I know that Council Vice President has a motion to amend the agenda to add a resolution honoring the life of Amelia Brown. Are there any other amendments to our agenda? Seeing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda with that amendment? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. <laughs> Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Councilmember Ellison. Council Vice President Jenkins. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are seven ayes. That carries and the agenda is adopted without amendment. Next, we have the minutes from our regular meeting on January 15th. May I have a motion to adopt those minutes? So moved. Second. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Allison. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and those minutes are accepted. Next, we have referral of petitions, communications, and reports to the proper committees. May I have that motion, please? So moved. Second. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Member Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Councilmember Fletcher. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Councilmember Ellison. 
Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That carries and those matters are referred. We do this morning have several honorary resolutions, so we will begin with those um, before progressing to the official business on our agenda. The first resolution, oh, sorry, I will also note that later in the agenda, you'll see a resolution honoring Ann Calvert, and there'll be a special presentation of that resolution at Tuesday's meeting of the Business Inspection, Housing and Zoning Committee. So the first honorary resolution that we'll take up is the honorary resolution to honor the life and contributions of Laura Waterman Whitstock. And I'll turn this over to Council Member Gordon to present that resolution. Thank you so much, President Bender. It's my honor and privilege to facilitate the presentation of this um, resolution honoring the life and contributions of and uh, I'd like for you to give comments. Maybe the clerks can assist and make sure that Marnie is in the meeting. And our guests may need to push star six on their phones in order to unmute. Madam President, we're not aware if she is uh, in the meeting. I don't have the correct telephone number showing, and uh, we don't see anyone unmuting a microphone. Well, maybe she can join in a few minutes, and I can begin um, reading the the resolution. Um, and also, hopefully, um, the other speakers can be prepared to speak to um, RT, Elaine, and Kelly. So this is a resolution honoring the life and contributions of Laura Waterman Woodstock. Whereas Laura Waterman Woodstock was an advocate for health, education, justice, and native sovereignty. And whereas Laura was a friend, confident, and mentor to many. And whereas Laura was an enrolled member of the Seneca Nation of Indians, Aaron clan, and was born at the Chattarugas Indian Reservation in New York on September 11th, 1937 to Isaac Jack Waterman and Clorinda Cleo Waterman. And whereas in 1945, Laura accompanied her brother William to Honolulu where she attended school and learned much of native Hawaiian culture. And whereas Laura joined her mother Cleo in San Francisco, where her mother served as chair of the San Francisco Indian Center and was a key figure during the 1969 Alcatraz takeover. And whereas Laura married Florencio Olivia Simas and became and began a family which grew to include uh, Joe, Arthur, James, Teddy, uh, and Rosie. And whereas before arriving in Minneapolis with husband Lloyd in 1973, Laura had successful careers in professional copywriting for major department stores and was an editor for the Native American Political Journal, a legislative review. And whereas in Minneapolis, Laura managed a media review program focused on Native perspectives for the National Indian Education Association, headed the American Indian Press Association, and helped to lead the Red Schoolhouse in St. Paul by raising funds to support culturally based education for its students and performing myriad of other tasks, including picking children up in the school van. And whereas Laura also helped found and direct McGeezy Communications, which is still educating children to this day. And whereas Laura directed the Heart of the Earth Survival School in Minneapolis, where she helped educate hundreds of Native children. And whereas Laura was known as a master multitasker and a very strong administrator who took on many tasks at once and did them all well. And whereas Laura was a founding member of the American Indian Community Development Corporation, and whereas for over four decades, Laura served on various nonprofit boards, including Independent Television Service, 
Native American Public Telecommunications, American Indian Cancer Foundation, Civic Media Minnesota, Minneapolis Foundation, Southeast Asian Refugee Community Home, Tawahi Foundation, Greater Minneapolis Metropolitan Housing Corporation, Rainbow Research, Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, Abbott Northwestern Hospital, Minnesota Planetarium Society, Minnesota Partnership for Action Against Tobacco, Rosie Simmis Dance, and the American Indian Business Development Corporation. And whereas Laura was appointed to the Minneapolis Library Board by Ben Mayor R.T. Ryback and subsequently ran for and was elected to the board where she helped lead the process to merge the Minneapolis and Hennepin County Library Systems. And whereas Laura had the honor of being the fourth Lewis W. Hill Jr. Fellow at the Humphrey Institute, where she also participated in the North South Fellows Program. And whereas Laura hosted first person radio on Fresh Air Radio for 10 years. And whereas Laura was very active in the Minneapolis political and the Minneapolis and Minnesota Democratic Farmer Labor Party, serving as a delegate to many conventions over the years. And whereas Laura was known for her great sense of humor, her generosity, and her breadth of knowledge. And whereas Laura's friends, neighbors, and family members remember her as a warm, generous, caring person, a great mother, and the world's greatest grandmother who loved people and who was loved by many. And whereas Laura Waterman Woodstock entered the spirit world on the morning of January 16th, 2021. And whereas donations are being accepted for Laura at the Laura Waterman Woodstock Legacy Fund by the Minneapolis Foundation, to support, support future journalists, writers, and poets. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Marin City Council do hereby honor and celebrate the life of Laura Waterman Woodstock and her contributions to her community and declares her birthday, September 11th, 2021, to be Laura Waterman Woodstock Day in the city of Minneapolis. Thank you for listening to that. And Laura was such a dear friend to me and a mentor uh, and a constituent, and McGeezy was also located in the second ward. So um, it's really special that we can take the time to do this. And I'm not sure if, um, if Marnie is here yet or RT, but I'd like to open it up if somebody would like to join us and speak. Councilmember, it looks like we have two guests at least on the line for this resolution. Um, so those speakers can push star six to unmute their phones and we welcome RT and Kelly um, to speak to this resolution. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Kelly, do you want to speak first or should I? Uh, you could go first. Thanks. OK, great. Well, it is just a tremendous honor to be able to um, to help celebrate the life of one of the great community elders, uh, Laura Waterman Whitstock. And I use that term elder, but I hesitate to because it usually implies age. And I think Laura was born wise. And she certainly was when I met her in the 80s. Uh, by then, she already had a very distinguished career as a writer, recognized nationally for her work in trying to uh, create a positive na uh, narrative around Native peoples to confront some of the extraordinarily racist narratives that were out there at the time. She was a great pioneer on that. But I met her when she was broadening that work. Uh, she asked me to join the Board of Colors magazine, which would, began to do that work about narrative change for all BIPOC communities. Uh, and uh, her work on that was, I think, really inspirational because she was able to take what she had done with Native peoples and try to broaden that work to work that obviously we're still very in need of today. Uh, when I became mayor, the very first appointment I made was Laura to the library board where Laura did extraordinary work. But she came to me um, when it came time for me to reappoint her and she said, you know, I could probably get elected citywide. Why don't we come together and find a way to get another voice of color onto the library board? And so she and I went together to Hussein Samatar who became the first Somali um, on a public board in the country. Uh, and that was because Laura uh, graciously stepped aside, ran on her own, and then she and Hussein became <clears throat> a very powerful partner, uh, partners in doing the library merger. Laura um, also with Megazi had done tremendous work and began to get into youth programming and Megazi became 
uh, under her and and very much under Elaine, uh, one of the great leaders in the Step Up program and doing really remarkable work getting young people involved in in technology. I could go on, but I just think in finishing, I want to say that we talk a lot about narrative change these days and rightfully, and rightfully about the fact that we should have been much more aggressively about this work generations ago. Laura never needed that lecture. Laura was the one who showed us the path on that. And we still have a lot of work to do. And I really wish that Laura hadn't had to devote her entire career to telling the truth about Native people. But she made tremendous progress. And I think as we tell the stories, the true stories about Native people and the contributions I that are made to this community, the first one should be Laura's. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk about a great, great friend. Thank you, and thank you so much for joining us this morning, Mayor. Next, we'll welcome Kelly, if you'd like to speak. Yes, thank you for um, allowing me time today to um, talk a little bit about Laura's impact in my life. Um, I first met Laura 20 years ago um, at Migazi's old building on uh, 31st and Lake Street. And I remember walking into the room and meeting her for the first time. I was nervous and scared to be in the room uh, with leaders in the community that I had looked up to. And I wasn't prepared to be in the presence of, um, of all these leaders that helped to change the world for us. And um, that day she asked me where I was from, where I went to school and, and my family. And I saw a spark in her eyes and her, her infectious, beautiful smile. And uh, she told me that I belonged in that room as a, you know, mid 20 year old young woman. And uh, from that day forward, Laura mentored me, loved me and my family. And she was with, with us through our challenges and our celebrations. She celebrated our marriage, the birth of our, my two children, uh, our graduations and was super proud of my attainment of my master's degree in philanthropy and development in 2008 and really mentored me to get through that program and work full time and have a family of five um, at that time. And you know, for many years we met every week, sometimes twice a week, so that she could help me navigate through the challenges and victories, um, both personally and professionally. And I think what's unique about Laura is it wasn't just about your job, it wasn't just about your family life, but how are how is everything intermeshed and how do we support that and honor that and, and be okay um, with the outcome? Um, you know, and I was able to sit with Laura a few days before she began her journey to the spirit world and and that spark in her eye from the first day we met was bright and, and shining. And so um, I, I really believe I am who I am today because of Laura and uh, I will miss her always and I'll uh, do my best to continue to honor her legacy with Migazi. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here this morning. We have Marnie on the line as well. You'll push star six to unmute your line and welcome. Uh, Oki, okay, good morning to everyone. Hopefully you all can hear me now that I have rebooted. Um, Laura and I met literally six days when I moved from, Min from New York City to Minneapolis and had been she was such a guiding star that um, it was pretty amazing that she was with me for so long and I treasure every moment. When I became president of Migazi, um, we launched a great many initiatives, one of which was the Native Academy. Um, we had Running Wolf. It was just a time of great growth and helping uh, native urban youth. And she, she taught me a lot. She was a great teacher. She was a great friend and I will miss her dearly. I have two poems. Uh, one actually is a chant that I feel reflect and will send. One is by a Haudenosaunee poet. Uh, Doug Stuber, uh, who is Heron Clan. A turtle rides and flies through the universe. We ride on the back of the turtle. The under gods dwell in Canadagua. The over gods dwell and look down from the clouds. 
even if we're 300 moons away from when this mattered, most of our lives are touched by one holy inspiration, nature. The next one is the native Hawaiian creation chant. Laura grew up in Hawaii and I did many things here in the Twin Cities with her. Um, she basically uh, introduced me to a lot of Hawaiian culture and, and that too was a bit of a blessing. This is the Kumulipo Wa Okahi um, and this translation is by Queen Liliou Kahalani. At the time that turned the heat of the earth, at the time when the heavens turned and changed, at the time when the light of the sun was subdued to cause light to break forth, at the time of the night of Makahilihi, which is winter, then began the slime which established the earth, the source of deepest darkness, of the depth of darkness, of the depth of darkness, of the darkness of sun in the depth of night. It is night, so was night born. Thank you. Thank you so much for those words and for joining us this morning. Council Member Gordon, would you like to close us out? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody and I'm so glad that you were able to get on and, and speak and share those memories. Um, I do remember the uh, spark in um, Laura's eye and the twinkle that she would get. Uh, she was such an amazing connector and bridge builder, um, helping connect cultures and all the differences and move us forward as a city. Um, she will be missed and I'm so privileged and honored that we were able to take a moment to recognize and celebrate her life and all that she's given to us today. Thank you everybody for your time. Thank you, council member. That will conclude the presentation of this resolution. It will come later in the agenda for the official action. The second honorary resolution will be presented by Council Vice President Jenkins, and it will be declaring February 2021 as Black History Month in Minneapolis. Council Vice President. Thank you, Madam President. And I am honored to um, share this resolution honoring Black History Month um, in, for the month of February. Um, and just thank all my colleagues, including Councilmember Cunningham uh, for co-authoring uh, resolution honoring Black History Month. Whereas since 1926 and the creation of the Negro History Week by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the accomplishments of persons of African descent have been recognized each February and whereas the month of February is observed nationally as Black History Month to recognize and celebrate the accomplishments of Black Americans have made and continue to offer to this nation and whereas Black History Month acknowledges and honors numerous past and present educators, scientists, activists, pioneers, leaders, artists, inventors, entrepreneurs, and elders with special ceremonies and activities. And whereas in 2016, to celebrate Black History Month, the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights introduced future history makers, renamed History Makers at Home, a profile series featuring emerging and mid-career leaders from the Twin Cities African-American community who share the department's ideals of advancing civil rights and removing barriers to equity. And whereas the department identifies trendsetters in the areas of business, criminal justice, education, economic development, health, philanthropy, housing, and government, and define them as history makers at home, and whereas the department that recognizes the kinship of the work of trend-setting history makers to those who are legacy trailblazers, and 
whereas to support our own history makers at home in the city of Minneapolis enterprise, an employee resource, resource group to support black employees, the Minneapolis Black Employee Network was created on February 23rd, 2017. And whereas each week throughout Black History Month, the Minneapolis Black Employee Network uplifts history makers at home, hosting events that shine the light on dedicated leaders in the Twin Cities region and shares the stories of those who are making positive impact and inspiring future generations, as well as recognizes legacy leaders who paved the path. And whereas on February 23rd, 2021, the Minneapolis Black Employees Network will proudly celebrate its fourth anniversary. Whereas the Black Employee Network offers Black City employees peer support, mentoring, professional development, career counseling, and well-being supportive services. And whereas the Minneapolis Black Employees Network offers the City of Minneapolis recommendations on action steps to recruit, retain, support, and engage Black leaders to the city's workforce. And whereas Black history and the contributions of peoples of African ascent are honored and lifted up at the City of Minneapolis, not only in the month of February, but throughout the entire year. Namely, the city recognizes the National Day of Racial Healing each year by a city council resolution and activities that tell the story of Black ancestry and our continued work towards racial justice and Black liberation in the United States of America. Whereas the city of Minneapolis in partnership with Hennepin County and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board recognizes and celebrates the week of Juneteenth with activities to commemorate June 19, 1865. On this date, what was believed to be the last of enslaved persons in the United States received news that their freedom and entitlement to natural born human rights under the law, which had actually been bestowed upon them two and a half years earlier when President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which had officially, which had become official January 1st, 1863. And whereas each year in July, we celebrate Black Business Week, created in 2019 by promoting the city's directory for and encouraging patronage of Black owned businesses and bring city officials leaders of economic development organizations and members of the business and broader community together to address the unique experiences of black business leaders. This is an effort to increase ownership, funding opportunities and business technical assistance for black entrepreneurs. And whereas each year we continue to highlight dedicated black leaders in the city of Minneapolis and the Twin Cities region. Now, Therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and city council do hereby commemorate the achievements of Black Americans as history makers and legacy trailblazers and their role in the development of the region and the nation since its inception. And we join in recognizing the annual celebration of Black History Month and the anniversary of the Minneapolis Black Employee Network. Thank you, Madam President, for this opportunity to share um, this resolution. And I do believe that um, Chief Fire Chief uh, Brian Tyner would like to speak on behalf of the uh, Black Employees Network. Thank you, Council Vice President. Chief Tyner, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Council President Vendor, Vice President Jenkins, and the rest of the council. Uh, I join you today virtually with the uh, co-chairs of the Minneapolis Black Employee Network, uh, co-chair Fatima Porter and co-chair Donald Brown. And uh, collectively, we would like to thank you for this really beautiful uh, resolution. Every February, we celebrate Black History Month in the US. 
uh, the occasion presents time to presents us a time to celebrate the many historical accomplishments of Black Americans and other Blacks around the world. It also presents opportunities for us to reflect and to learn more about Black history. So in the spirit of learning and celebration, I would like to respectfully challenge each one of you on the council to begin each committee meeting and each council session throughout the month of February by announcing one fact about what happened on that particular date in Black history. A quick Google search should provide you with all the information you need. And as a chief, I don't believe in asking anyone to do anything I wouldn't do myself. So I looked up a few examples. On this day, January 29th in Black history, in 1820, Harriet Tubman was believed to have been born in Dorchester County, Maryland. She also shares this birthday with Oprah Winfrey. Harriet Tubman is best known for leading slaves to uh, freedom, north to freedom, through a, a um, <clears throat> network called the Underground Railroad. Um, and uh, if you are wondering what she looks like, she will also be the next face you see on the $20 bill. On this date in 1837, Alexander Pushkin died in a duel. Alexander Pushkin to this date is still considered to be Russia's greatest poet. In the spirit of learning, I must confess that up until this week, I'd never realized that Alexander Pushkin was black. On this date in 1908, the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity was incorporated. It included such esteemed members as W.E.B. Du Bois and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And on the same date in 1913, the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority was incorporated. And its most famous member right now is our current vice president, Kamala Harris. Finally, in 1926, Violet Neatley Anderson became the first African-American woman admitted to practice by the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, while I still have the floor, because, you know, giving me a microphone is always a dangerous thing, uh, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank and congratulate the eight members of the Minneapolis Fire Department, as well as the many others across the enterprise for whom today represents the last day of their careers here serving the citizens of Minneapolis. I thank you and I salute you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Chief. Would anyone like to add anything for this resolution? Seeing none, thank you again to Council Vice President and the Chief. Our next resolution will also be presented by Council Vice President Jenkins, and that will be the honorary resolution honoring the life of Amelia Brown. Council Vice President. Thank you once again, Madam President. And um, it is with deep sadness and humility that I read this resolution honoring the life and legacy and the contributions uh, to the city of Minneapolis by Ms. Amelia Brown. Um, Amelia was uh, more than a colleague. I considered Amelia a friend, um, a fellow artist, and um, and she was a, a deep friend to many. I'll just jump right into the resolution because it, it really speaks to her extraordinary life and extraordinary contributions, once again, to the city and, and to the broader world. Honoring the life, the legacy, and the contributions of Amelia Brown. Whereas Amelia Brown was a coach, consultant, writer, speaker, artist, with more than 20 years of community development experience spanning four continents. Amelia was the city of Minneapolis's first and founding program manager dedicated to the implementation of the Creative City Making Initiative when it transitioned from Intermedia Arts to the Office of Arts, Culture and Creative Economy. And whereas under Amelia's leadership, the Creative City Making Program works to address racial disparities in the city of Minneapolis through artists and city staff collaborations. Amelia brought her 
skills, her knowledge, and 20 years of expertise in emergency arts to clarify the program's primary goal to build relationships between city staff and underserved communities through arts-based practices so that the city can better serve those communities. And whereas Amelia was a fierce advocate for social and racial justice, dedicating her time, her energy, and heart to eliminating racism. She was a part of the of a community of practice that was trained under the leadership of Resma Menachem and Rachel Martin to build anti-racist culture and work with myself to declare um, racism a public health emergency. And whereas Amelia was innovative and visionary in implementing the creative city making programming. Her work led to changes in the city's policies, procedures, and practices to better serve marginalized communities through collaboration with community and city staff. Some of her work included the Hearing Tenants Voices Project, which led the city's first rent, I'm sorry, which led the city's renters first ordinance and the creation of the El Camino de Corazon mural in the in City Hall and the Northside Oral History Project with the Division of Race and Equity. The mapping of invaluable cultural assets in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood with the Community Planning and Economic Development or CPED Department, the 2020 Census Complete Count Project with the Neighborhoods and Community Relations Department, Artists on the Greenway with Public Works and the Southside Green Zones with the Sustainability Division. And whereas Amelia's expertise and development of emergency arts also helped the Arts, Culture and Creative Economy Division to establish the Creative, Re the creative Response Fund focused on creative healing and support for communities directly impacted and affected by the escalation of trauma, stress, and violence as a result of the killing of George Floyd. And whereas Amelia was a loving partner, daughter, sister, and aunt to her beloved nieces and nephews who had a special relationship with her dear chosen granny, whom she spoke of often and spoke to almost daily Furthermore, Amelia was a national treasure beloved by so many friends and comrades across the globe and here at home. And whereas as the founder of Emergency Arts, a central resource dedicated to building a cross sector network, strengthening community resilience and advancing arts as an integral um, part to emergency management, Amelia made it her mission to provide resources to transform crises through creativity. Her commitment to humanity shined in this important work under the most dire of human circumstances. Amelia didn't just do this for work, she embodied this in all of her interactions. And whereas, as repeatedly expressed by her family, and loved ones, her many friends and colleagues are resounding statements of how much her brilliance, her big smile, loving aura, warm hugs, and compassion for others was unmatched. Amelia's ability to make everyone she met walk away feeling love and light, she exuded to make this world a better place. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and city council do hereby honor and recognize Amelia Brown for her many contributions to the city of Minneapolis, the arts community, and for the light she poured into everyone fortunate enough to know her. Thank you, Madam President. And I will just add that um, the passing of Amelia Brown has left a deep hole in, 
to employees of um, the city of Minneapolis, to the arts community in Minneapolis, and to art artists and healers all over the world. And so I just want to offer my deep condolences to her family and friends who I know are on the line listening, and we will be sending out this resolution um, to her partner and to other family members um, after this uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Vice President. And in addition to the mark that she's left on everyone who knew her, um, it was really um, meaningful to hear how much her work has touched our city and the way that we'll see the evidence of that compassion and brilliance in our community for many years to come. So thank you so much. And I'll add my condolences to the staff and her friends and family that are mourning Amelia. Any other comments on that resolution? Seeing none, we will um, again take that up under the resolutions as part of our official agenda. And that will bring us to Mr. Carl, who has an announcement to share this morning. Mr. Carl. Thank you, Madam President. Chief Tyner noted uh, that today is the last day for many city employees, and I wanted to take just a quick moment to note the departure of Irene Casper, who has served the city of Minneapolis for more than 35 years. Uh, she has been a fixture in the clerk's office where she's been a part of our legislative support team. And during her career, she has now worked with 59 council members, five mayors and five different city clerks. Um, during that three plus decades in the clerk's office, she clerked for almost every single committee and every permutation of committees that the council had established. The only committee I know of that she managed to avoid was Ways and Means. So she was probably smart on her part. She also holds the longest record for service as clerk to the council's zoning and planning committee, which effectively means I think that she's earned a degree in community zoning. And of course, as part of the amazing clerk team, she has supported the work of the full city council for 35 years. In fact, in my first year here in 2010, it was Irene Casper who sat next to me as the second clerk for every council meeting. And as, so, as, as is often the case, because of her close association over so many years with specific committees, Irene has developed one of the strongest relationships with council member Goodman. In fact, Irene was such an integral part of that team that when I first started talking about rotating clerks several years ago, council member Goodman said to me that she didn't care how the other clerks were reassigned um, and that that didn't matter to her, but I would not be taking Irene away from her committee. If I did so, she would consider that an indication that I was prepared to pack my desk. So it's often the case between council members and their clerks that the clerks are instrumental to their council's success. They are the procedural experts, the guides, the behind the scenes problem fixers who make our system operate effectively, efficiently, and seamlessly. And Irene has certainly done that over a 35 year career. So I wanted to take time to recognize my colleague, Irene Casper, with whom I've had the privilege to work for this past decade. She will be very much missed by me and all the members of the clerk's office and her many, many friends across the city enterprise. And I also wanted to ask Council Member Goodman if she would offer a few words for Irene as well, whom I know is watching. Thank you, Casey. Council Member Goodman. Thank you, Madam President. Let me first just say to the families of Amelia and Laura, may their memory be a blessing to you and your family during this very difficult time. Uh, it's with a very heavy heart that I hear those resolutions and just wanted to chime in. Irene, I know you're listening and you know that there are so many people who are upset that you're retiring, yet we're happy for you. We're happy for you because you are one of the best golfers in women's golf, we know. We're happy for you because we know you'll have more time to buy lottery tickets, hang out at the racetrack, and otherwise collect lottery pools, even though we won't be able to be part of them. You have been the clerk for the committees, various committees that I've chaired for almost 20 years, and you have helped all of the city staff understand the important importance of the clerk's office and the importance of ensuring that we have a process uh, within our legislative um, rulemaking that makes sense to people. There are almost 120 people retiring as of today, but to me and to many of the council members that you've served with, including everyone on this call, we never thank the clerk's office enough uh, we always um, work to try to figure out how we can get the rules 
in place, but you have been able to teach us and all of the different departments that um, report to the committees that we serve under how to get things right. You will be truly missed in the office, and I hope that we'll have the opportunity to see you virtually and in other places as you move forward towards your retirement. To you and all of the other people who have served the city so well, mazel tov to you on this retirement, and thank you, Madam President, for giving me an opportunity to speak. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Any further comments on this? I don't see any, so I'll just add my thanks as one of the chairs of the Zoning and Planning Committee um, and many other instances. You know, we really look to the clerks um, as we're being, um, you know, handling a lot of very controversial, very emotional things, zoning and parking uh, among the highest uh, heated controversies uh, we tend to see at the local level. So your study presence has been um, just really, um, really appreciated by so many of us, like, as Council Member Goodman said. Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you once again, Madam President. And I just want to just offer my um, congratulations to um, Ms. Casper on a, a long career of public service here at the city of Minneapolis. Um, I have known you for 18 of those 30 plus years you committed to the city, um, Irene, and have appreciated um, the the time that we were able to to spend together just on a personal note and talk about our love for sports and athletics and um your golf career as as has been noted and so just want to wish you the best in your retirement and and thank you for your service to the city of minneapolis thank you mayor fry thank you madam president previous speakers have already expressed their adoration but uh, Irene has been such a calming force through some of the most difficult uh, and controversial items. She's she's a, a constant and a mainstay in our city, and Irene, you'll be greatly missed. Thank you. This concludes this portion of our meeting. I will just say, oh, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. I didn't want to let the moment go by without also expressing my gratitude to Irene and many thanks. And it's been great getting to know you over the years. And I'm just really excited for you on a personal uh, level, even though we're going to miss you deeply at City Hall. Thank you and all the best to you. Thank you. Anything else? I just want to say that um, we have folks um, a lot of folks retiring, we offer the early retirement um, option, and so a lot of those um, retirements are coming through now. And I just, um, I know that we've taken some time to highlight um, a couple of uh, folks um, or I've been today. And um, I just want to say that, you know, so many of our employees are uh, leaving after very distinguished careers, many, many, many years of public service. As I always note, our families also give up a lot for those of us who um, step up to serve our communities. And so just want to offer my appreciation and thanks um, to an excitement for what's to come next for all of the folks who are retiring uh, today and, in, in, you know, in this time period uh, right now. So thank you. That brings us to our usual order of business. So our first item under new business is the mayor's report about the state of our local health emergency addressing the city's response to COVID-19. Welcome, Mayor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, many of you already have the report in front of you. I will try to be brief. Uh, we have had 21 emergency regulations to date. Uh, most all of those regulations are, are in compliance, or I should say lockstep with that of the state thus far. Um, there's a couple of remaining aspects that we're looking um, at, at coming into, uh, into lockstep with them as well, predominantly in restaurants. Um, the statewide statistics, there's a, there's a total approximate number of completed tests, 6,467,868 uh, total positive uh, in Minnesota is 458,633. Um, moving to uh, hospitalization, uh, the total cases hospitalized cumulative are 24,100. 26 
with total cases hospitalized in the ICU at 5,015. Minneapolis case information. Uh, total positive cases are 31,358 with uh, 2,181 hospitalized, 30,391 uh, have been ever covered, and tragically 371 deceased. Um, there is a chart here that should be in your report showing Minneapolis uh, demographic information, and I know our, our health department will, will and should be available to answer any questions you have <clears throat> on that front. Uh, as for situational updates, over the past week, there have been about 80 new cases per day on average. This is the first time the daily numbers of cases have been below 100 in the past three months. Uh, and so this really is you know, cause to begin seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. Um, at the very least, uh, it's a better trajectory than what we were seeing previously. And the new case rate in Minneapolis has decreased significantly. However, we're still seeing at least 10 new cases per day. Uh, and, and we're also averaging uh, five hospitalizations, one ICU admission, and, and one death uh, per day. The seven-day uh, rolling average rate for Minneapolis is 17.1 per 100,000. Um, of the COVID-19 cases in Minneapolis, 63% have been interviewed and 2.3 have been have refused, 2.3% that is. Uh, case investigators are interviewing an average of 90 cases per shift and making an average of 148 calls per shift, plus a conducting workplace and other contact follow-up. Uh, cases now have the option of completing the interview online. Uh, as for COVID vaccination, uh, the health department continues to vaccinate people in the phase 1A groups and is providing second doses for EMS staff. Uh, six vaccination clinics will be held this week for more than 300 individuals over 1,200 vaccines have been given out to date, uh, and the health department is also offering vaccines to blue and white tax drivers who provide non-emergency medical transport for COVID patients. Uh, and the city is working also with uh, Hennepin County to vaccinate sheltered and unsheltered homeless individuals. <clears throat> uh, moving to community vaccination perspectives and outreach, the health department staff uh, participated in the city's cultural radio shows during the month of January. Uh, and on each show, they provided updates on COVID-19 vaccination efforts and other important safety measures. Uh, MHD established agreements with five community organizations to serve as trusted messengers. Uh, there was a vaccine perspective survey as well with more than 4,600 community members responding. Uh, and by the way, we're moving very quickly from 1A, the first phase onto the subsequent phases as well. Um, as for COVID-19 testing, in the past week, 104 COVID-19 saliva tests uh, were provided at three um, uh, community-based events. COVID testing in Minneapolis has dropped. And by the way, those tests are in addition to uh, many of the others that are already taking place uh, uh, run perhaps by other jurisdictions. COVID uh, testing is in, in Minneapolis has dropped by about 20% compared to the last quarter of 2020. Uh, the city's testing webpage offers the latest information on testing sites and guidance about what to do while you wait for COVID-19 test results. Uh, the health department is offering free saliva tests uh, to community partners, organizations, and businesses. Uh, and MHD has a, a good inventory right now of personal protective equipment, masks, hand sanitizer, gloves, and are able to fulfill community uh, and business requests for supplies. Um, moving to procurement. Uh, as of January 27th, uh, 2021, there has been uh, 9,180,292 spent. The increase in spending of a little over 4,000 is attributed to several contracts for COVID-19 testing. Um, that number includes only purchases made through the emergency purchasing regulation, which allows for emergency COVID-19 purchases to be expedited to respond to urgent COVID-19 response needs. And as I always do, the total costs far exceed the amount included in the emergency purchases report. Um, for state and federal activity, uh, on Tuesday, uh, uh, Governor Walls released his administration's proposed 2022-23 budget proposal. The $54.2 billion proposal prioritizes working families and businesses who've been most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, highlights of the proposed budget that impact the city, enterprise, and residents include 
maintaining existing levels of LGA. Uh, there's also 150 million for redevelopment and appropriation bonds to assist small businesses. Uh, 21 million in increased investments to DHS programs that addressed housing instability. Uh, there is a number of other items that I, I won't go into, but they are they should be noted in your written packet there. Uh, federal update. Uh, we have a new administration. Uh, since President Biden took office on January 20th, he has signed over 24 executive orders, many of them uh, reverse uh, orders signed by the previous president and addressed uh, the nation's COVID-19 response, economic relief, workforce protections. Uh, I won't go extensively into this. Uh, I'm, most of you have been following the news. Uh, a federal emergency uh, a rental assistance program, the the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, uh, approved by Congress at the end of December, included $25 billion nationally for emergency rental assistance. Minneapolis received $12.8 million in a direct allocation as one of seven jurisdictions in Minnesota with a population of more than 200,000. Um, both Hennepin County and the state of Minnesota will also be able to serve Minneapolis residents in some capacity with their direct appropriations. Um, moving on to gap funding, there have been 1,653 households that have been approved for emergency assistance payments through the gap fund, and that totals $2,582,611.92 as of Tuesday, January 27th, and city staff are working through the final batch of approvals and appeals from the emergency housing assistance list. Uh, staff do expect a final round of approvals and assistance payments issued next week. Uh, the MPHA has also has completed a review of all applications uh, right now in the Stable Home, Stable Schools COVID-19 emergency expansion list. Uh, and Minneapolis GAP funds for, ha for a housing dashboard is updated weekly and includes aggregated demographic and geographic information. Don't hesitate to let us know if you would like uh, to see that. There's a link I should, that should be on the PowerPoint and in your written report as well. Um, thanks for your time. I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Thanks, Mayor. I don't see other council members in queue. I do have a question about, um, I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of how much city capacity would be going to things like the testing or vaccinations. And then I've seen that the state and county are both adding capacity to their health departments, either through job details or hiring additional staff. And so do you anticipate there being a need for that capacity at the city level or would be more relying on the county and state? Excellent question, Council President. Uh, so in actually previous reports, we have had the numbers of staff at our city that have been transitioned from their normal job responsibilities to that of COVID-19 assistance in some way, uh, be that testing um, or, or, or even assistance in planning or assisting with vaccinations as well. Um, to, to give you a, a better information, um, I, I, I hope that uh, either our commissioner or someone from the health department is on that can perhaps answer Council President Bender's questions better. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Gretchen Musicant, Commissioner of Health. Um, yes, as we look at uh, the next few months, um, we will continue to have this uh, three-pronged uh, level of activities, uh, contact tracing and investigation, um, testing and uh, vaccinations. And uh, there will be many other, and there are other um, organizations involved in uh, the vaccination and the and the testing. Um, we are uh, trying to fill the niche of uh, having access to people who are um, highly impacted by COVID and yet might not be uh, targeted by some of the other organizations. So, especially in in testing and um, vaccinations. And of course, we will continue to need to hold um, our responsibilities for contact tracing. As I have mentioned in a few other um, venues, we do expect some um, challenges in staffing our contact tracing because of loss of staff to um, other responsibilities uh, coming up. Our food inspectors will need to get back out uh, and interact with, with restaurants uh, now that they're open and uh, we have a contract with uh, AmeriCorps, um, and so we are um, exploring whether or not we can continue that after it expires, I believe, at the end of March. Um, 
and um, are just finalizing a, a proposal of uh, what we expect um, our, our needs to be going forward. And so we'll be sharing that with, with you all um, when that is prepared. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of council members now. Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam President. And Mayor, I, I just had a, I guess a comment to really just continuously um, emphasize the importance of us reaching out to communities of color to um, make sure that we are vaccinating the most vulnerable people in our communities. It, it's really been um, kind of challenging to, to see the nine, you know, different vaccination sites throughout the state and none are really accessible to communities of color. Um, be, you know, there's one in Brooklyn Center, I believe, and I know North Point has been doing some vaccinations, but we need to make sure that we are um, uh, vaccinating um, our, our low income, our communities of color um, in equitable ways before um, the pandemic I mean, before the um, vaccinations, you know, run out um, because there has been a supply issue. So we want to make sure that we're getting these communities uh, vaccinated. So just a comment. Thank you, Madam, Madam Vice President. Thank you. Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Council President, uh, and th thank you, Mayor. I was actually going to ask a very similar question to Council Vice President Jenkins, but I do actually want to ask if we have any updates on getting a Minneapolis location. I know we have a lot of entertainment venues that have been forced to shut down that would be willing to repurpose their space uh, to create transit accessible uh, sites so that as we're starting to be able to offer vaccinations to the general public, there are places that uh, transit users uh, and others who might be challenged to get to suburban locations could uh, uh, could go. So I guess I'm just curious if you have any updates about uh, vaccination sites in the city. Uh, great point, Council Member Fletcher. Uh, at, at this time, and I'll pass it over to Commissioner in a second, but um, one, of, one of the main impediments has actually been the supply of vaccines as, uh, and has not necessarily been, as you stated, the locations. Uh, in other words, we've had plenty of space to do it. Uh, we simply have not had the supply um, to, to move forward. Um, uh, that being said, I know that the health department has been working on this and, and, and is trying to, to get some additional locations there. Um, Commissioner, can you comment uh, additionally? Absolutely. Um, thank you for the question. It's a, it's a burning question for me as well. Uh, just today in, in reading my, my email exchanges from, from the state health department, um, I, I do believe, and I, I'm not free to say where, but there will be a Minneapolis location. Uh, for for one of their um, ongoing um, offerings, and it it will be available um, in a in a transit uh, accessible way, and um, yes, uh, to to build on what the mayor said, the amount of vaccine is is a, is a limitation. We do know though that the federal government is becoming much more transparent and is telling us how much vaccine they will distribute in, in three week increments, which is really incredibly helpful for planning. And uh, we are all uh, thinking that that will help us make sure that we are using every, every drop that comes. And um, we are also moving uh, from one stage uh, into another so that we will uh, be offering more vaccine. And I have just heard anecdotally in the last day uh, quite a number of healthcare providers are reaching into their um, elderly populations that they're serving and offering vaccine. And so I'm hoping that that will um, also begin to fill, fill some of this hole that, that we all feel very anxious about. So thank you. And, and I'll also note uh, that there are uh, vaccines being given out at our uh, elections headquarters here in Minneapolis um, and that among other sites that we're uh, previewing now. Yes, yes, our main location is at, at our early election site that we are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Osman. Uh, thank you, uh, 
Madam President, I, my question is so what are uh, uh, steps of uh, is city taking when it comes to a cultural approach to vaccination? Uh, there is a real fear of vaccination uh, uh, in some communities in, in Minneapolis and uh, there's a stigma surrounding that. So uh, what steps are we taking to make sure that uh, we are approaching uh, the right way and not just, uh, um, you know, uh, well, what steps are we taking? Do we have a plan? And can you go details on that? And my office is definitely open to help out if there's any anything on that. Thank you, uh, Council Member Osman. Uh, you are correct. Uh, there is misinformation out there regarding both the efficacy and safety of vaccines. Uh, and, and thank you, by the way, to your office. Uh, you have repeatedly stepped up and, and been willing to help disseminate information so that people understand the importance of getting vaccinated uh, with, uh, with, for COVID-19. Um, and so I, I know that we have already we've directed and, and, and asked uh, both our health department as well as our communications staff to, to, to help put together a, a plan uh, to uh, make sure that people know the safety of vaccines, and that's including doing things like having our chief of, of fire, uh, Chief Tyner, get vaccinated in a very public fashion. He certainly won't be the last. Um, and if you're able to disseminate and share that, showing that you know public officials, uh, uh, people that certainly are you know seem to be close to the information, are, are understanding the importance of getting vaccinated, then we're able to push that out even more so. And we're going to have just information that is provided, um, you know, in multiple languages to make sure that people are are are, uh, are aware of the importance. Um, and, and thank you so much for your willingness to disseminate some of that information. Um, I don't know if 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 either our commissioner uh, of health and or our director of, of communications has anything further to add on that front, uh, but I can assure you, yes, uh, we're, we're definitely on top of that. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor and um, uh, Council Member Osman. We um, have been working since October to engage community members to really understand what some of the issues are and to form relationships, trusted relationships, uh, people who can serve as messengers within their communities. And um, also, as the mayor, I, I believe, said in his presentation, had a, a survey and so have really collected many of those um, beliefs uh, from the community and have had have used our time on culturally specific radio to not only provide information, but to answer questions as well. And so we have established agreements with five community organizations to serve as trusted messengers, and I can get you more information about that. Also, um, the presentation I will be making to um, public health and safety next cycle, um, we're going to focus, one of our main focuses will be on, on vaccinations and another will be on our community engagement so I can give you even more details at that time and and I really appreciate your offer of assistance as well. Thank you. Anything further on the mayor's report? Seeing none, that completes that item. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioner. And we will, um, I will direct the clerk to uh, receive and file that report. The next order of business is a report for the reports from our standing committees. We will begin with the report from our Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee given by the Chair, Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Madam President. The Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee is bringing 13 items forward for approval this morning. Item number one is a new license in the 12th Ward for the Tipsy Steer. Items number two, three, four, and five and six are all land sales. Item number seven is the interim use permit required to open the indoor tiny villages in the third ward at 1251. And I will note they did have a temporary occupancy permit, so they have already started housing folks who have come from park encampments. Item number eight are appointment, appointments to the City Planning Commission, and item nine are appointments to the Arts Commission. Item number 10 is exclusive development rights with the City of Lakes Community Land Trust for a commercial land trust project in the 10th Ward. Item 11 is a grant 
um, in our low barrier housing program. Item number 12 is an exception to our inclusionary zoning requirement. This is to facilitate 12 free units that will be provided in partnership with Firefighters for Healing, um, which is an organization that helps burn victims get access to health care at Hennepin County Medical Center. And item 13 are grant applications to the deed redevelopment grant program for a large number of affordable housing projects. With that, I'll move items 1 through 13 for approval this morning. Councilmember Goodman has moved the committee report. Any discussion? Seeing none. Thank you, Madam Chair, for all of your work shepherding these projects, especially the tiny homes, the, the villages project. Um, I know you've leveraged so many relationships and um, knowledge that you've accumulated over the years, so I'm not sure that would be um, operating today if it were not for those efforts. Anything further? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Hi. There are 12 ayes. That carries and the report is adopted. Next is the report from the Policy and Government Oversight Committee presented by the Chair, Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam President. The Policy and Government Oversight Committee brings forward 29 items today. Item number one is an amendment to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development 2020 Consolidated Plan Action Plan. Item number two authorizes submission of the 2021 Pay Equity Implementation Report to the Minnesota Department of Management and Budget. Item number three is a resolution to provide for the sunset of the Neighborhood and Community Engagement Commission. Item number four is various appointments to the Transgender Equity Council. Item number five is a resolution accepting fourth quarter 2020 donations. Item number six authorizes the city to join an amicus brief in the in the case of Cedar Point Nursery versus Hasid. Item number seven authorizes the city to join an amicus in lawsuits that challenge the federal administration's immigration related policies. Item number eight is a legal settlement related to the Target Center rally, the details of which are listed on the agenda. Item number nine is a contract amendment with independent emergency services related to the 911 call handling system. Item number 10 authorizes the increase to a contract with Miller Dunwoody, Dunwoody Architectures Incorporated. Item number 11 is a contract amendment with Intech Software Solutions Incorporated for consulting services. And items 12 through 29 are various contract amendments related to the public service building project, the details of which are listed on the agenda. And, and to that end, I will just note, um, and Councilmember Fletcher noted this in our Pogo uh, committee, but Greg Gokey, who has been shepherding this project and has um, served the city of Minneapolis for uh, multiple decades, um, is also uh, one of those 100 plus uh, employees that are retiring today. So we thank him for his service. And with that, Madam President, I move approval of the Policy and Government, Government Oversight Committee report. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Is there any discussion on the committee report? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. 
Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. And uh, Clerk, I would like to be counted uh, for biz as well. I was struggling to get unmuted, if that if that's appropriate. I'll come back to that in a moment. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye, and I will note that uh, I was informed that uh, Mr. Goki has served the city of Minneapolis for 34 years. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes on the POGO report, Madam President. That carries and that report is adopted. Councilmember Ellison would like to be recorded as an aye for the previous agenda for biz. Is there any objection? Hearing none, the clerk is directed to record that vote. Which means the biz committee passes with 13 votes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have the public health and safety committee report given by that committee's chair, Councilmember Cunningham. Thank you, Madam President. The Public Health and Safety Committee brings forward five items for approval today. The first is approving mayoral and council appointments to the Civil Rights Commission. Item number two is um, authorizing a signature by the Minneapolis Health Commissioner or their designee on updated and expanded health care plan insurance contracts for school-based clinic, clinic services reimbursement. Item number three is authorizing the Minneapolis Police Department to enter into release of liability, hold harmless in defense and indemnification agreement with Met Council related to ownership and maintenance of the workforce director system. Item number four is authorizing an issuance of a request for proposals for violence interruption outreach services for the Minneapolis Minneapolis Strategic Outreach Initiative. And item number five is a staff direction um, directing staff to come back with an action plan related to eliminating child lead poisoning in the city. I would like to um, amend item number five to include council members Johnson and Ellison as co-authors, and I will move approval of all five items, including the um, amendments with number five. Councilmember Cunningham has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. Finally, we have a report from the Transportation and Public Works Committee given by the Chair, Councilmember Reich. Uh, thank you, Madam President. The committee will be forwarding 13 items today. Uh, item one is the Grand Avenue South Street Reconstruction Project. Two is the contract with Neighborhood Recycling Corporation doing business as Eureka Recycling. Three is the contract amendment with In Control Incorporated for the Fridley Filtration Plant Rehabilitation Project and General Services Programming. Four is the contract amendment with SciCon Incorporated for the Ramp A Waterproofing and Structural Repairs Project. Five is the contract amendment with the Minnesota Department of Transportation for temporary storage of impound vehicles under I-94 Bridge. Six is the contract amendment with Max Steiniger Incorporated for the 34th Avenue Street Reconstruction Project. Seven is a contract amendment with Meyer Contracting Incorporated for Bridge 9 Pier 6 7 Repair Project. Eight is a alley easement deed for TF Hennepin LLC for a portion of 2841 Hennepin Avenue. Nine is the alley assessment uh, deed from DREH LLC for a portion of 2940 17th Avenue South. Ten is the Bicycle Advisory Committee appointments. Names are listed. 11 is the Penn Avenue North, uh, Plymouth Avenue North, the 14th Avenue North Street Reconstruction Project layout approval. 12 is the Downtown East Street, uh, Street Reconstruction Project designation. And the final item is the bid for upgrades of the um, American with Disabilities Act pedestrian ramps project. Uh, Madam President, I move all items. Councilmember Barreich has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. 
Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmasano. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and the report is adopted. The next order of business is reports from the special committees. We do have a report from the executive committee, which will be presented by Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you again, Madam President. The executive committee brings forward one item today, which is a resolution amending the 2020, 2021 wage freeze. Um, and I move this, uh, I move to refer this item to the POGO committee. Council Vice President has moved the one item for referral. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and that matter is referred to POGO for the next cycle. The next order of business is notice of ordinance introductions. We have two notices this morning. First, Council Member Goodman gives notice of intent to introduce the subject matter of an ordinance amending the code to add and amend provisions related to administrative hearing proceedings. And second, Council Member Goodman gives notice of intent to introduce the subject matter of an ordinance to add and amend provisions of the Animal Care and Control Code related to lifetime license applications and rabies procedures. Any questions or comments on either of these notices? This is given for these ordinances and no further action is required at this time. The next order of business is the introduction and referral calendar. We have a number of introductions and referrals this morning. The f and these are all detailed in the agenda as well. The first is from Council Member Reich, who moves to introduce to give first reading and refer to the Transportation and Public Works Committee. The subject matter of an ordinance that amends the composition of advisory boards in certain special service districts and changing the name of the 48th Street East and Chicago Avenue South District as reflected in the chapter shown in the agenda. Second, Councilmember Fletcher moves to introduce, give first reading and refer to the Public Health and Safety Committee, the subject matter of an ordinance adding a new Article 7 to the Workplace Regulations Chapter of the Municipal Code to establish recall rights for certain hospitality workers. Third, Council Member Goodman moves to introduce, give first reading and refer to the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee, the subject matter of an ordinance adding and amending provisions in the code's heritage preservation regulations related to a waiver process for designated properties. Fourth, Council Member Reich moves to introduce, give first reading and refer to the Transportation and Public Works Committee, the subject matter of an ordinance to repeal and replace chapter 54 in whole to meet state and federal Clean Water, Air, Clean Water Act requirements and improve water resources in the city. Fifth, Council Members Ellison, Gordon, Osman, and myself moved to introduce, give first reading, and refer to the Business Inspections, Housing, and Zoning Committee, the subject matter of an ordinance to amend the Housing Code to add just cause, eviction protections, and a pre-eviction filing notice requirement. Sixth, Council Members Gordon, Ellison, and myself move to introduce grant first reading and refer to the Policy and Government Oversight Committee, the subject matter of an ordinance to amend the city charter by referring to the electorate at the general election on November 2nd, 2021. The question of giving the city authority to exercise power to control rents on private residential property in the city, and also to refer to the electorate the question of whether to amend the city charter to add initiative and referendum for the sole purpose of exercising the city's authority to control rents on private residential property. 
And finally, council members Cunningham, Fletcher, and Schrader moved to introduce grant first reading and refer to the Policy and Government Oversight Committee the subject matter of an ordinance to amend the city charter by referring to the electorate and the general election on November 2nd, 2021, the question of creating a new charter department to provide public safety services, including law enforcement, and removing the police department as a standalone charter department. Are there any questions or comments on any of these ordinance introductions? Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just wanted to very briefly um, say, because uh, I know that there's a lot of questions and focus on it, just very briefly name that um, today we are introducing the language uh, for a charter amendment related to creating a new Department of Public Safety. Um, as folks will see in the attached documents, the language will be very simple and straightforward in alignment with the rest of the charter's plain language style. Similarly to other departments, the details of the organizational structure, like the specific lines of business and operational details will be codified in ordinance rather than in the charter itself. Um, this is where that work will really take place. So more details will be forthcoming and I'm really looking forward to digging into that work with all of you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Council Member. Any further comments or questions? Seeing and I, I will just note um, related to the um, charter question that uh, my colleagues and I have brought forward for today. Um, we've we've caught most of you, I think, to um, offer some explanation for the various options that are presented in these two charter questions. Um, and I've also had the chance to um, reach out to the Charter Commission as part of my discussion with them last week um, to initiate some conversations about this. Um, state law um, allows Cities, of, cities like Minneapolis, charter cities to um, enact policy to control rent, in this case, a rent stabilization policy. Um, but there's a bit of an open question about exactly the mechanism by which we would be able to do that, and that would likely be answered in the courts. Um, I know St. Paul is also having some discussions at the community level about this kind of policy. Um, so we have offered two charter amendments that would provide for three pathways for a potential future rent stabilization policy. Um, that could be an ordinance adopted by the City Council. It could be a ballot question initiated by the City, city Council or um, an initiative or referendum question initiated by the voters. Um, so we are happy to answer further questions about that. We've worked closely with the City Attorney's Office over a number of years to um, understand the possible outcomes related to this under current state law. And we've also had some discussions with our delegation members who are working on this at the state level. So thank, uh, I see now Councilmember Johnson in queue. Thank you, Madam President. I'll be quick. I just wanted to share for members of the public who are watching this when a vote like this comes up with these introductions and notices, uh, this is about allowing there to be uh, public hearings and debates through our council committees and processes. And so I think that's important context for folks to realize. And, and uh, it's uh, not a approval of the language as is, it's not a, an approval of a concept. Uh, so that takes place uh, later through debates and discussion and committee procedures. Uh, and I just want to let folks uh, know that who might be watching and might not be aware of that. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. That's helpful. Any further discussion, Councilmember Fletcher? Uh, thank you, Council President. Uh, I'm uh, just noting that the referral on number seven. I I think the authors had thought it was going to public health and safety, and um, th this has it referring to Pogo. So I guess I'm. Uh, I, I put myself in queue mostly because I I, I wanted to uh, confirm with the clerk that that's proper procedurally, or see if if uh, it makes sense to have uh, the public health and safety committee be the referral to host the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Carl. Madam President, to uh, Councilmember Fletcher's uh, inquiry, 
The clerk's office has routed this to the Policy and Government Oversight Committee because it is essentially substituting for the former Intergovernmental Relations Committee, which had jurisdiction over all matters of charter. So in its capacity to take on the Intergovernmental Relations functions through POGO, uh, we had deferred that to POGO um, since that was the jurisdiction for anything related to charter amendments. Thank you, Mr. Carl. That will uh, leave us with likely a very long POGO meeting uh, in two cycles when the hearings would take place on both of these charter questions. So we'll make sure to note that for council members. Council Vice President Jenkins. Uh, happy to let it go to public safety and health if uh, that is the will of the body. Thank you. Madam Chair, Council Member Fletcher. Uh, on, on, unless there is uh, a, a objection from the clerk uh, that it would be procedurally improper, I will make the motion to amend item seven uh, to refer to the Public Health and Safety Committee rather than to POGO. Second. Is there any discussion on that, Mr. Clerk? Any concerns? No, Madam President. Maybe from a time management perspective, a bit easier to manage for the public. Any further discussion on that amendment? Madam President, unless there's objection, I would simply include that as a restatement of the motions that are severally before the council now to approve the introduction calendar. Thank you. So I'm not hearing any objection to that proposed amendment. With that, um, seeing no discussion, clerk, please call the roll on the introduction and referral of the ordinances. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. No on seven. Aye on the remainder. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye on items numbers one through six and no on number seven. Councilmember Cano. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes on the report, except for number seven, which has 10 ayes and two nays. That carries, and those are referred. They will go to the standing committees as noted in the agenda. Next, we have the three or four honorary resolutions that were um, presented at the beginning of the meeting. I'll ask for a motion to adopt all of those honorary resolutions. So moved. Second. Thank you. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and those resolutions are adopted. Um, before we end, I'll note that we have a request for a closed session to receive a security briefing related to the upcoming trial of a former MPD officer. Um, I'm going to actually ask, I always forget to do announcements if I don't do them before we leave and reconvene. So I'll ask if there are any announcements from council members before we move to closed session. Seeing none, we will then proceed to move to the closed session. 
um, I will ask for the city attorney to give us the reasoning for the requested closed session. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the receipt of a security uh, report or uh, briefing. Under Minnesota Open Meetings Law, Minnesota Statute Section 13D.05, Subdivision 3D, meetings may upon proper motion be closed to receive security briefings and reports to discuss issues related to security systems, to discuss emergency response procedures, and to discuss security deficiencies in or recommendations regarding public services, infrastructure, and facilities. If disclosure of the information discussed would pose a danger to public safety or compromise security procedures or responses. Financial issues related to security matters must be discussed and all related financial decisions must be made at an open meeting. So before closing the meeting under this section, you must in describing uh, the subject to be discussed, refer to the facility systems, procedures, services, or infrastructures to be considered during the closed meeting. And to that end, uh, this briefing is specifically related to the security preparedness of the entire city enterprise in anticipation of the March 2021 trial of a former Minneapolis police officer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Router. I will move that the meeting may be closed pursuant to the open meeting law, Minnesota statute section 13D.05 subdivision 3D to receive a security briefing related to the upcoming trial of a former police officer as explained by the city attorney. Is there a second? Second. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 12 ayes. It carries and we will now move to the closed session. So council members will have to close out of this meeting and join the other meeting in teams. Thank you.
Madam President, this is Casey. I believe we have uh, most, if not all, of the council members back into this public session. And so if you want to reconvene us, I can call the roll to verify that and we can proceed. Thank you. Let's see, so the time is 12.25 p.m. The City Council has reconvened an open session following our closed session about a security briefing. I'll ask the clerk to record that we have a quorum bait um, and call the roll. Councilmember Gordon. Here. Councilmember Cano is absent. Councilmember Reich. Here. Councilmember Fletcher. Here. Councilmember Schrader. Uh, here. Councilmember Osman. Here. Councilmember Cunningham. Present. Councilmember Ellison. Present. Councilmember Goodman. Present. Councilmember Johnson. Present. Councilmember Palmasano. Present. Vice President Jenkins. Here. President Bender. Here. There are 12 members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. There is no action from our closed session. So with that, we have completed our agenda. Without objection, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Have a great weekend and we are adjourned.